Hi, this is Paula Gloria, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. The purpose of today's show, which is being recorded December 16th, 2007, is to kind of see if I can uh, sort of tie up some subtle concepts. And the subtle concepts have to do with how we live in this field of density within the play of the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, let's see, earth, air, fire, water, and then ether. Ether, or the master I studied with, the sky element, <coughs> is uh, sometimes the most difficult to get a handle on. Uh, when I was in a Tibetan refugee camp in India, after doing many, many, many months of long mantra practices that had to do with unfolding the different elements, different mantras for different elements. My final conclusion, based on my personal experience, was that the fifth element is the element of integrity. And it's something that you can only point at, and it has to be experienced. All things in life that are worthwhile have to be experienced. And the reason we pay attention to masters or those who've gone before us in the path is because they can give us some hints so that we don't get caught up on our way to uh, balancing all the elements in such a way that we begin, that we can unfold the meaning of our soul and how our soul interacts in this field of density within the five elements. So. <coughs> To try to make that more practical, for my sake, I've always looked on the internet as something that has to do with the air element. It's something that moves very quickly, it permeates everything. Of course, in truth, all of the elements permeate everything. I mean, I don't know how many people realize that a sound wave or, uh, say, telephone, we always think of it as going through wires, well, it also goes through air but sound can be propagated even more efficiently through the ground. And I think this is something Nikola Tesla was doing work with, but I always emphasize Nikola Tesla was not the only genius. There have been many people who have thoughtfully observed nature and have come up with methods and I guess you'd say technologies that the rest of the world can benefit from, provided that the knowledge that they come up with isn't co-opted. Hence, we find that uh, there's always whispers about solutions to our energy crisis, and uh, that these solutions got stomped on. The people were either killed or their patents were bought up and buried. But you begin to see that there's also an element of deservability. If people like to pay for their gas and electricity and sort of feel efficient that way, I mean, it's fun to go out and get a job and make money. It's kind of like playing a Monopoly game. You, uh, you acquire this and you work with it and you, uh, you work within that illusion. Now, the Divine Mother that has, that's often called the Five Elements is also called Maha Maya, the Great Illusion. So in other words, these elements play with each other to create the world that we see. And I think that game, oh, somebody's coming through here. The game that children play where you've got the rock and then you've got the paper and the paper covers the rock. But if you are scissors, then uh, the scissors can cut the paper. And let's see, then the rock can, can uh, beat up on the scissors. So that's a rough way of looking at how the elements play with each other. And Ayurveda is based on the system of the elements and balancing those elements in each individual's unique uh, constitution and makeup. So you're never going to completely have one element dominate the other, otherwise everything falls apart. So it's this, this this delicate balance going back and forth that makes the creation that we know. Now, I made quite a foray on the internet 
uh, by posting a lot of my TV shows. I always call that something more with the air element, what goes on in the internet. With my Manhattan Neighborhood Network show, I call that something that works more with the earth element because it goes through the cable and it goes out through Manhattan's um, dirt. Now, both of those elements, though, you can't have just one or the other. Uh, I don't know what you would say with water or with fire. Fire is the element that destroys, but also gives warmth. And so you can see a lot of the technologies that we, that we long for to heat our houses uh, would probably have to do with that fire element. So yesterday, I posted something on the internet that was kind of uh, a provocative uh, come on to try to see if I could get an unknown person who's, who's, who, I don't want to say hides behind a handle because that's sort of the nature of the internet that you can create another ego, another personality. But the thing is, you're eventually going to have to come down to the same rules of the regular old, you know, dimension that we're used to where things are more slow moving in order to do manifestation. So to bring things down to a physical level, I sort of, um, I, I provoke something, let's face it. Now, I have also fessed up to the fact that I like to flirt. Flirting is fun. It's, it's, it's part of working with the illusion. But at the same time, I very much do not play games because I am really excited about the manifestations that can be created when you do have command of the elements and you understand this delicate play. And that's something that when you do do a manifestation, that's so rewarding. And it's something that takes more than just yourself. And, and I think that's the whole fun part. So I do flirt, but I also don't play games. Now I'm standing right here with Gramercy Park behind me. I would like to go into Gramercy Park, but the trustees of the park are very touchy. You can't have anything commercial. And I've insisted, oh, no, no, I'm not commercial. This is all public access and, and public contribution. But, you know, I don't want to be annoying flying into the radar. The other thing I was going to do is go down to the East River, again, to emphasize the importance of spiritual practice and rising at sunrise and gazing at the sun. But it started to rain, and uh, I didn't know if I wanted to sit there with an umbrella. So I did the next best thing, which is stand right in front of my apartment building. And I think as a shareholder, I'm somewhat entitled to, uh, to use this space. But, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll be hearing from somebody's lawyers. Now, last night, I had my first evening shift at the Village Scandal hat shop. And the Village Scandal stays up until at least midnight. It stays open until midnight sometimes stays open until 1.30 in the morning because it's right next door to Missorglis. Anyway, that's the oldest ale shop in Manhattan. And um, sometimes people come in feeling a little expanded from their drink next door and, uh, and inspired in ways that they might be a little bit more constricted in the daylight hours. It was a very interesting experience for me to spend that time and here's what I want to share with you and why I was inspired to, uh, to do some on-the-scene shooting here in Manhattan for this show that's December 16th. Um, a person came in and I had a lot of people to serve so I couldn't give him a lot of attention at the beginning. But it turns out he was from Bulgaria and he was looking for a hat uh, like his father had. And then he pulled out a photocopy, it undoubtedly had to be a photocopy, it was blown up, of him and his father, and he was just a little boy, you know, maybe four, four or five years old, standing next to his father. And even in this grainy, you know, not highly detailed uh, reproduction of a photograph, you could see the elegance in which his father was dressed, but also the simplicity, because they were standing next to what would pretty much look like a hut. And I've seen that kind of um, scene 
in Cyprus because when I was trying to create an echo village, I brought architects out and we were looking at the stone houses, how people who were living more closely to the earth would, would build their houses. And his English wasn't that great, or else being a musician or an artist, he just sort of, uh, you know, kind of like Nico Haupt had acquired these skills, where the very speech itself, there's a certain art to listening to it, and they want you to kind of stretch that way because that's half the process. Well, this guy was like that. And as he pointed to his father's not only hat, his pants, he said the pants were made out of wool and silk. And they were some amazing pants that he had been given, and I don't know, I guess they finally wore out, wore out. But this reminded me of something that John Cheshire had said. When we look at um, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, we notice in their living spaces they didn't have closets. And the, reasons, the reason they didn't have closets is because fabric was very rare. It was very difficult to put something on a loom and weave it. And once you had it, you really treasured it. And that's what this fellow was relaying. And so, you know, he went on looking at hats and other people came in and I sold some hats and, and I connected with him again. And pretty soon I started to learn his story more and I could see that this $58 hat that he wanted was kind of a stretch for him. And I did something that I never do is I lowered the price. And I said, you can have it for $50. So Wendy, Wendy Barrett's my boss. Uh, please forgive me if I, uh, if I made a mistake on this. Later on, when he pulled his wallet out, I could see he didn't have that many bills in his wallet. And later on, when all the customers went away and we got to talking more, because I think at that late hour, people who were a little bit, you know, looking for somebody to talk to or for some companies sort of start to open up. Well, what I discovered was something I certainly didn't want to discover, and that was that he was homeless. And I got to thinking, oh my God, I sold a $50 hat to somebody who's homeless. Well, today, upon reflecting on that, I don't feel badly about it, because I could see he really liked the hat, the hat looked good on him, and I think it's important that we do things that make, that make us feel better, and that we have a certain faith that that more abundance will come tomorrow. I think this isn't, whoops, someone's coming through. Okay, this is a throughway. Like I say, it's in the front of my apartment building. So back to the fellow who I sold the $50 hat to. Uh, eventually he was forward enough with me that I could be forward back to him. And I said, but you know, you don't smell like a person who's been living on the streets because we've had a few people like that come through and they probably enjoy the warmth of the store. And he said that he joined a gym. So if you join a gym, then you can take showers and so on. So later on, another customer came in after he left and he was a chauffeur and he was looking very, very elegant. He was a black man. and. Uh, he came in with a nice with a nice hat. Well, it turns out this guy really likes to look put together. He spent a lot of time looking at hats. I had other customers coming in. And then at the end, I started to talk to him more. He, he actually didn't have cash on him because he wasn't thinking about buying a hat and he didn't bring his credit cards because I heard him later on saying that he did, he did the hood thing where he put some money down. He put $20 down on two hats which was really interesting to, to hear him on the cell phone. What I'm trying to relate to you is I had an extraordinarily rich experience working in the East Village hat shop yesterday. And he also gave me some hints about the homeless situation because it really, really came home to me last night just how many people are living in Manhattan homeless. They're living out like, you know, here I am all bundled up and I really prepared myself. Like I say, I was going to go out to the East River and I only made it to my doorstep here. But, you know, it still, it still takes a little bit of planning. And so you've got people now where Manhattan is really, really their home. It's not like, well, you know, just go out to New Jersey and dig up an aunt or, or a mother or, or somebody you can move in with. It just doesn't work that way. 
And so these people start to live by their wits and you would never believe some of the people who are homeless that, that, that you're interacting with every day. You just don't know their story. And for sure there's a lot of shame going around it, a lot of uh, bad feelings. You can also have a certain amount of victimization. People become in despair and hopeless. But I want to point out another aspect to all of this, and this has to do, again, going back to the elements. One of the first times that I started to go out to the East River at sunrise, I encountered a homeless person. I've told this story before. And when he saw me up that early, he said, uh, don't jump. Because he figured somebody like me dressed as I was dressed, obviously having a warm place to sleep at night, must be suicidal. You know, that I only got up that early and went out to the river to commit suicide. And I think this is a statement about our culture. If we were in India, which is uh, a culture that's more nature-based, even Hinduism, people have claimed is not even a religion, it's so connected with, with nature. And I guess the idea is, if you have the play of the five elements on one side, and then you've got will on the other side, the whole idea of becoming a master is to develop your willpower so you can work with the five elements. So Hinduism has this extraordinarily blended. In 1950, they uh, had something, the Hindu marriage law. And what that was trying to do was get their culture more in sync with what the people in power felt was more advanced or progressive, which was the West. And they figured one way to do this was to emulate our marriage customs. So the Hindu marriage law said that a man could only have one wife. However, what few people realize is that prior to that, uh, under Hindu uh, working with the elements, uh, uh, understanding was that a man could have more than one wife, but, but also a woman could have more than one husband. So this means that they were taking a look at the way the elements roll along in one's life and the type of changes that go on in one's life as a soul works with developing their willpower to work within the five elements so that this play of intention and, and just the way the elements um, always will balance themselves, how there can be a terrific uh, learning experience or movement forward in the expression of how the universe unfolds itself. So that's something I wanted to relay, that there's a lot of people who are homeless, but they're forced to be more in t to tune in more to what's going on with nature. If you're having to really wonder about whether it's going to rain or snow tonight, because you're going to have to figure out where you're going to sleep, uh, you're going to be thinking about this more carefully than somebody who has a house, an apartment, where, you know, you just turn up the electricity or turn up the heater. Or in the case of a lot of these overheated townhouses, uh, I remember it was driving me crazy one year, I would regulate the temperature during the winter just by opening my windows because so much heat was coming in through the central radiator system which seems to be, uh, you know, a great waste of resources. But again, this idea, it's, you know, being a Capricorn, my nature is to be very conservative. And I think it's because of developing a mindfulness that that's valuable. This time of year is associated with sacrifice. And the goat that uh, Capricorn is associated with is usually what was used in a sacrifice. And the idea being that to get something you have to give something. And then this gets into the whole play of animal rights and that animals shouldn't have to be uh, a victim of the whims of people and then the human rights, certain humans shouldn't have to be the victim of other humans. But I always remind people, who ensures these rights? And this was the idea of the original sacrifice of Abraham. He wanted to get lined up with the biggest, baddest power that he could and his earnest money was to let go of something that was the most precious to him. 
And uh, this is something I will go into in the future in much greater detail, but isn't appropriate for the, for the topic at hand. And the topic at hand was just to consider when you think you've accomplished so much because you have a nice warm apartment and you have so much food on the table and maybe in the case of these uh, powerful criminals, international syndicates that are so involved with the, the weapons industry and they're starting kind of fake movements that uh, get you to consider things up to a point and then you know, you're involved with the group that sh shames you for wanting to go farther. Even in their case, for their total human life experience, they're going to want to know what's going on with everybody. And, you know, because the person who's homeless and sleeping out on the streets, he's learning something and his soul is, is gaining an experience that you won't have when you're insulated from that kind of challenge. And the idea of challenges is that if you can overcome them, you accomplish something of, of great richness that you then can share with others. And this sharing process is a very interesting thing. If people only knew how human nature longs to share, and that if you ask, you'd be really surprised what you can get, as opposed to thinking that everything is in this limitation and scarcity model, if you're in the limitation and scarcity model, then you're going to think, you know, you have to store up stuff or uh, more for you is going to actually mean less for somebody else and you better cover up the fact that you're taking more, at least the person you think that you're taking away from is going to have less. But in truth, if you start looking at these technologies, the free energy, the zero point energy, that I do not think is unique to Tesla alone and we have to worship certain uh, geniuses or hide behind you know those who know about these technologies are saying well you know Nikola Tesla was such a genius even though I'm working with the government like uh, Hal Putoff is you know he gets a couple million dollars a year um, nobody can understand him because he's such a genius I'm really really beginning to question that but I'm also saying that the viewers from their side have to do something to uh, pay attention in their life and see if indeed there's not some missing energy around, even in your own life. See the kind of racism you may have inherited from your forefathers, along with the great models of nobility and sacrifice that was done in order to ensure a more meaningful life. And if you can shed some of the downside, which is the racism, you'll be able to unfold in your life greater power, more meaningful relationships. And with more meaningful relationships, even things, you know, the worst diseases, every single disease has its, its base, has at its basis heartbreak. And again, that has to do with the intention and the willpower working with the five elements. If you start developing the willpower so much that you become oblivious to the five elements, like, you know, you don't care whether it's raining or snowing at night because, man, you know, you got that sucker under control, you know, you've got your heating, you've paid your bill, it's going to come. So you've disconnected from learning the intricacies of that particular element of nature. And these people who are homeless, I'm telling you, they have a lot to offer us. And in the same way that I'm saying if you're homeless, don't get into the victimization, but try to study what's going on, not only in the coldness around you in the case of the winter, but how your soul worked yourself into that situation, what you're trying to learn from it. By the same token, those who are all nice and warm and cozy and can go out Christmas shopping and get gifts, but they're still really pissed off and annoyed at the Illuminati or the international uh, criminal syndicate that's pushing weapons, directed energy weapons, they're hiding what's really going on in the World Trade Center. If you compare yourself to them, also consider you have rich experiences that they don't have. And, you know, life gets very boring after a while when you have so much money you can do anything you want. I've been there. I mean, I didn't have that kind of money and power, but I had enough that I could run up $20,000 a month on my American Express, and I never even checked the receipts. 
I mean, uh, just to give you an idea of what that was like, once my American Express card wasn't working and I was all bummed out and offended and I called them up from Europe, finally got a lady and uh, as we were working it out, I said to her, well, just tell me, you know, what's my credit limit? And she looks on it and she looks at it and she goes, well, your credit limit's $5 million because I could never get a credit card before. And, and the reason I had the American Express card is it automatically came along with having this um, stock that was uh, a reverse triangular merger so that when we sold our cellular company that was based on being in a lottery, which, is, which again is a topic I'm going to go into more because Robert Ashford and his idea of binary economics with Kelso, which Harold Channers always talking about, is talking about distributing wealth not through labor but through capital and I realized my own experience was an example of that. I tapped into uh, a lottery process that had enormous odds in my favor or anybody who knew about it and as a result some of the capital got distributed my way and that's how I ended up with an American Express card because they just gave it along with your stock by the time we sold out the company. So I said, tell me, you know, what's my credit limit? And she goes, well, it's $5 million. And then she goes, are you um, a famous singer? And I said, and she had a drawl herself, it was, which was delightful to listen to. In those days, uh, you got people from this country more often. Uh, you know, not to say that I don't enjoy the people from India at the call centers, because having lived there, I'm interested in their story too. And they're always so eager to practice their English on us. And she goes, are you a singer? And I said, no. And I said, well, why would you ask? And she said, because you have such a beautiful voice and you're filthy rich. That's how she put it. Oops, someone's coming through. Actually, they weren't coming through. They were just picking up the newspaper. But it looks like I'm uh, getting to the end of the tape anyway. So I just want to say this is Paula Gloria. The show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole, and I'm trying to tie it into uh, what's been going on in YouTube. Uh, I had something where I was trying to uh, encourage one of the researchers on 9-11 TV Fakery to come to New York. And that night we were also streaming live at Harold Channer's uh, Christmas party, and that worked out really terrifically. And I'm hoping that we can do more work with the live stream. And we didn't rec we didn't tape it because I didn't even bring a tape. I was out of them or whatever. So there's going to be stuff that you should stay posted to rabbitholecentral.tv that you may not see. Uh, it may not be recorded in the future.